Uh, joining me now in New York is David Bonson, the Bonson Group CIO and managing partner. And from Tampa, Florida, Tony Shear, Smead Capital Management Director of Research and Co-Portfolio Manager. Now, uh, d- both of you own uh, J.P. Morgan, David, right? Yes, big so, position. So how did you feel about the quarter? Like, can, can it really get better from here? It, it can, and they've continued to show that. They're, it's an execution story for them. The business model is there. To me, what continues to be shown in these quarterly results is how much they're benefiting now from mm-hmm. actions that took place 10 years ago. That acquisition of Bear Stearns in the bottom of the financial crisis, the Washington Mutual, they have a built-up leverage and a scale that none of their competitors have. They're operating with an entirely different set of rules about how much pricing power they have and how much operating leverage. It's a phenomenal story, all without any assistance from net interest margin. Um, and Tony, you as well, you own JP Morgan. Walk me through sort of what, what's the highlight for you. Well, I mean, a 9% top-line growth number is phenomenal. I mean, a, a billion dollars in, in, in uh, a su- positive surprise on, on the uh, trading side was phenomenal. Uh, you know, and this is before there is any real wind to their backs in terms of the uh, the lending, you know, that's gone on, as you just talked about, the net in, in interest margins are not really helping them. So it, it's a great quarter. I, you know, to say that they would have had a 17 plus, a, a, a strong high teens ROE, I don't think anybody would have believed that if you mm-hmm. would have said that a year or two ago or even coming into this quarter for that matter. So I think that they uh, ha- have a very efficient story and they are ready to continue to just make money. Uh, as the economy continues to pick up in lending, you know, the, 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 which is a side they have not seen yet. David? I think that what is interesting about the dividend growth aspect that we uh, hold on to so much at Bonson Group is how J.P. Morgan actually did sort of forecast this strong return on equity. They grew that dividend third quarter of 2018 by 43 percent. In the middle of what they anticipated to be a big tightening cycle with the Fed, there were all kinds of headwinds with trade war and monetary policy, and yet J.P. Morgan was boosting their dividend higher. And to me, that is what we love to see is management saying, Mm -hmm. here's how confident we are about our future, our ability to execute and and deliver these results. So once again, you see the dividend being a sort of foreshadow of positive earnings results and operating results. I guess when I just look at, you know, the numbers, say, on FIC and investment banking, and then uh, if I wrap in Citi as well, I mean, it's a 49% increase uh, in FIC, just totally trumping it. And Tony, I guess I'm just wondering, when you take a look at these numbers, are they taking each other's market share? Is the pie getting bigger? And if it's the former, they can't put up these kind of numbers in print always. I think the market share story has to do with scale. And uh, so they and all the big banks really are taking market share from the regionals. You know, Wells Fargo, they're still sorting through things as we saw in the quarter today. There's a new CEO in place. They're working through regulation. They settled $16 billion in Q3 to try to, you know, move the ball forward in that regard. So they're working their way, way forward here. But the bottom line is Wells Fargo, Bank of America, you know, J.P. Morgan, the guys that have the money, the depository base, I mean, J.P. Morgan just grew its depository base. Yet again, another 6% in a lower interest rate environment. So people are putting money into their bank even, even though they're willing to receive less. So scale matters, you know, uh, uh, quite a lot here, and they'll continue to benefit from that. I mean, they can put up these numbers if the economy is growing. I mean, that, that's the thing about the banking sector, particularly to his point, the mega banks mm-hmm. are highly levered. It's very pro-cyclical to overall economy. So when you look at fixed income trading, but also investment banking activity, and then, of course, ultimately their lending businesses, if the economy is growing, these are all things that they are now making profits from. Uh, it's why you see that BBT and SunTrust merger is those regionals needing to come together to become more competitive with the larger banks. But I still think J.P. Morgan deserves differentiation from even the other mega banks. It's a different story than Wells Fargo mm-hmm. and Citi. They're in a different regulatory uh, uh, area. They're not under the same scrutiny uh, from the Fed as far as their own financial strength. And I think that they actually have embedded pricing power globally to continue expanding. <laughs> So I, I guess my question, though, is like, what's going to be the next catalyst to continue to drive the earning estimates higher? 
Well, again, it's net interest margin is what has not been there, and yet they've still been pushing earnings higher. So and meaning it's, that if you got a steeper yield curve, that would be a, a steeper yield curve is just an automatic mm-hmm. mathematical mm-hmm. boost to earnings per share right off the top. And then again, if macroeconomic growth is able to pick up, then you have more banking activity mm-hmm. that just continues to providing that boost. I, I think it's important to remember, we keep putting this chart up in front of clients. It's fascinating to see in the last 10 years. Obviously, huge growth up in government spending and huge growth in, in corporate spending and, and debt as a percentage of GDP. Household debt as a percentage of GDP has dropped substantially. How could there be even a further uh, a boost in consumer mm-hmm. activity, mortgage activity, housing, uh, that number just levering even higher. Now, ironically, what could end up being really good for the banking sector might end up being what hurts us macroeconomically into the future. I don't want to see an over-levered household sector, but we don't have an over-levered household sector right now, so there's still that room uh, whereby the banking sector can grow. Uh, so, um, Tony, you were talking a little bit about maybe getting positive on Wells Fargo. Uh, walk me through that thesis again. Uh, well, you know, th- this was a quarter where, uh, you know, first first quarter of the new CEO, we think they're in a regulatory cleanup period of time. Um, as things go from bad to better to, to best is when the stock gets revalued. So you're looking at a Wells Fargo at, I think, 12 times their, thereabouts earnings, uh, price of earnings. Uh, that's atypical for it. It typically is traded at a premium. It might take a while for it to get back to trading at a premium for the bank peers, but that's a good thing. That's when you want to own the name as that kind of gets gets resolved. So it's it's a great franchise. They've got lots of opportunity. Um, as you saw in the quarter, they've got a lot of, you know, I think probably low-hanging fruit in terms of expense management to right-size the ship as they prepare and, and get, get this regulatory behind them. So I think that's all positive for it, and you're able to buy it at a, at a, at a bargain price. So, David, go ahead. Well, I, I agree uh, that the thesis would be um, beneficial to Wells Fargo, but I just think there's a better opportunity in J.P. Morgan. He's right. Wells is trading at 12 times. J.P. is trading at 13 times. And J.P. has been the far better uh, performer and executor throughout this time period. I also think Wells has more of a political overhang still. That kind of uh, clouds over them where they go from a regulatory standpoint. As we talk about earnings season, what we're going to focus on is corporate profits. If you come inside the Bloomberg Terminal, this is U.S. after-tax corporate profits. Been on some kind of decline since 2014. With me, David Bonson of the Bonson Group and Tony Shear of Smeed Capital Management. David, when you look at that chart, do you then see we're in a liquidity-driven Fed rally, or do you see there's a room for improvement within corporate profits? Uh, it's both, and, and I think there's two different stories embedded in the last five years. You had a market slowdown. Uh, because it doesn't line up perfectly with calendar years, we never talk about it. The stock market did not move from the middle of 14 to the middle of 16. We had a two-year flat period, and that was the period at which earnings growth was really decelerating. Mm-hmm. You had a huge pickup in corporate profits in 2018, and the market was down because it had been up so much in 2017. That chart tells the story of stock markets being discounting mechanisms. They are pricing in today what they believe about tomorrow. We just got done with a 25 to 30 percent year in stocks, Mm -hmm. anticipating 2020 profit growth. If we don't get that 9 to 10 percent profit growth in S&P this year that is forecasted, that bodes very poorly for stocks. On the other hand, if you outperform earnings growth expectations, which is what we've done over and over again, including last year, all four quarters, profits were better than had been expected, even when they were slightly negative. All right. Well, let's stick with that, that sort of glass half full uh, idea here, Tony, because when you look at that mm-hmm. chart uh, and you think about the, the two back-to-back quarters that we've had with regards to uh, slowing profit growth, people will point out and say every time we've been in this position before, we have had uh, a pretty significant rebound, I think something on average of about 7% here. Uh, so are you looking at this more as kind of a floor of where we should be? Uh, you know, I think the earnings expectations have, have been ratcheted down. I think it's a relatively low bar for companies to be able to beat on earnings this quarter, just broadly speaking. I think wh- where it's a higher bar is PE expansion. And so I-, I think of it as kind of the Apple market, right? I mean, Apple, as an example, has worked well here in recent periods because of PE expansion, not so much earnings growth. So I think where there's an expectations mis- mismatch is the multiple that have been put on some of the kind of exciting companies or, or maybe the companies that are perceived to be as, as safe, you know, the low vol trade. 
as an example. I think that's where the expectations need to come down. I don't think it's so much with the fundamental earnings uh, and the ability for these companies to be able to beat this quarter. I mean, ultimately, any market that ever becomes dependent on multiple expansion mm-hmm. is generally a market setting us up for some disappointment. And it's one of the Absolutely. advantages being given growth-driven, value-driven. Uh, look, I, I, I think people have been saying it for a long time. This should really be a stock picker's year. You're starting off 18 times forward in the S&P. Regardless of where exactly corporate profits grow, it's going to be very hard to get multiple expansion to drive returns. What you can get is companies that outperform expectations on a bottom-up basis. 2020 should be a very good year for talented, selective managers. Something else that I'm really fascinated with, though, today uh, is what's happening with BlackRock and Larry Fink. In his annual letter uh, to investors, he basically is urging uh, corporate executives to sort of shift their opinion on climate change. And what I find interesting about this, you know, there's $7 trillion. Follow the money. Now, passively, you can't do anything. But on an active level, you can. But that's still a lot of money that could have put some weight behind it. Yeah, and I mean, it's interesting, too, because, I mean, how does a company like BlackRock really sort of unwind all that and this idea too that a lot of other asset managers uh, in this field I mean it's easy to sort of say we're going to do it it's easier yes. to sort of put up a curtain and say look look how green we are now but as we've heard he's run into some issues with uh, with regards to criticism and people saying that maybe the strategy isn't as sort of uh, detailed as yeah it. David Bonson what do you think well there's no detail at all and so I woke up to the uh, headline that there was this massive global capital reallocation coming uh, comparisons to how this is far bigger of an issue than the financial crisis, inflation in the 70s, 80s. It was a very thoughtful article. Larry Fink is a very articulate writer and speaker, but I think that people want to get meat on the bone if we're going to continue hearing that there is this need for a dramatic paradigm shift. Ultimately, and I, I don't mean this critically, but I, there's a, a fairness to the accusation of virtue signaling versus substantive depth around it. What does it mean that capital markets are going to be dramatically reallocating a paradigm shift coming? Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think it, it comes off a bit more preachy than it does substantive. But well, isn't part of this also because, I mean, clients have been asking for this as well? Well, I don't know, because when he says it's the number one thing our investors are talking to us about, I cynically don't believe that. Okay. I'm an asset manager. Mm-hmm. My clients ask me about the returns. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, I, and I believe that clients of BlackRock want to know their returns. I think that there's a broad interest in global affairs. There's a wide diversity of opinions in climate. But what I think Jamie Dimon's done a little bit better better of a job at than maybe Fink did here, is is pointing out we, we all care about sustainability. We all care about stewardship. The devil's in the details, mm-hmm. and there's so much that has to be kind of worked out bottom up yeah. to get there. So, Tony, uh, maybe you could pick up from there on this idea of inf- inflation expectations, because the market uh, really hasn't done much to sort of meet, I guess, what would be the Fed's hope uh, that the market would take a little bit more of a, of a stronger view with regards to uh, rising inflation. Uh, what exactly is going to be the catalyst that actually gets that? Uh, you know, increased consumer spending. And, and I go back to what I was talking about earlier, the, the millennials starting to show signs of life, <laughs> which we think is a matter of time and, and, and not a small thing. So we, we, we do think that this is going to pick up in a surprising way at some point going forward. Right now, the market, as we just saw, is not really looking for it, not on the lookout for it. The headline is that inflation is dead. Uh, and that's been the theme for, for quite some time. This is another data point to uh, cause people to remain complacent in that, in that way. Um, but look, the, the, there's a massive, you know, demographic pig through the python going on here. <laughs> Uh, and we're in the early stages of that happening. Yeah. You know, as household formation picks up, the ancillary spending that goes around that whole phenomena is no small thing on 86 million millennials strong. All right, pick through the python. I've never mm-hmm. heard that one before. David? Yeah, I mean, that, but see, that kind of economic activity is not inflationary. Yeah. And this is, I think, the big confusion where the Phillips curve has gotten so beaten up through this period. Uh, you can have productive growth, and, and, that, and it is not inflationary. The Fed's desire to create inflation, if they wanted asset price inflation, they got it. That's not what they wanted. Uh, I think that even this talk 
talk of now going to an averaging to look at the 2%, being able to kind of run hot to, to make up for those periods where you ran at sub 2%. The Fed has sort of told you we're either going to uh, redefine inflation or, or be very tolerant of running above inflation as long as we need to run very accommodative monetary policy for the foreseeable future. Well, then I wonder, Tony, is it possible that you have different dynamics in different uh, sectors? Like some sectors we're looking at things like peak margins and unit labor costs being just way too high versus others that have a lot more flexibility. Some have passed through to the, to the consumer and raising prices. Some don't. Tony, how do you look at it? Yeah. yeah. And, and let's not forget, <laughs> I mean, we have been importing deflation, if you want to look at it that way, particularly, particularly since we let China in and WTO in 1999. Uh, until today. So we've had this deflationary cost of goods in a world where the demographics hasn't been where it's at today. So now we've got this demographic ahead of us and we've got arguably a, a point in time where perhaps over the next, you know, decade plus, the deflation importation story might be broken. So the Phillips curve has looked broken for a long time now. There might be some point where it starts to matter again. And we think we're, we're headed towards something like that going forward. Uh, there may be points in which it appears that it is mattering again, but it, it can't. economic laws don't work that way. If it's broken, it's broken. The reason the Phillips curve appears broken is it's a flawed theory. You can have productive non-inflationary growth. And I think that, to his point, the demographic story could very well go that way. But the idea that us importing deflation mm -hmm. is about to stop or is maybe bottomed, yeah. I think, ignores the debt deflation crisis worldwide. I think this is a generational mm -hmm. story. So then for a sector allocation or just sort of company allocation, Tony, uh, Mark Hayfley of UBS said, look, you just got to lower your expectations. Returns are not going to be what they used to be. The U.S. earnings cycle is not going to deliver the same kind of returns that we would expect to see last year. And Asia might actually do better. Um, is that going to be the story of 2020? Uh, you know, you know, we're, we're value investors. So where you want to be is where people are. not and where people aren't and where they are very distrusting right now is economically sensitive things, cyclicals. Uh, where they have too much excitement, I talked about it a little bit earlier, is the low vol trade, the safety trade or the perceived safety trade, uh, and the fang and the exciting tech, you know, new economy stuff. So that's where you don't want to be. You know, it's, it's totally abnormal for the next decade of stock market leadership to be the same thing that led the market over the last decade. And we've certainly had a decade where that's, that stuff has led the way. Uh, to believe in the economy, to believe in the kind of bread and butter kind of guts of, of the economy working, like Main Street working and being good, is really doubted right now. So that's where we, we, we think you want to be right now. Yeah, one of the easiest forecasts to make for 2020 is that asset market returns should not be as positive in 2020 as they were in 2019, coming off a 29% S&P and, and uh, 7 8% treasuries. Lower expectations for overall asset class returns is different than saying they'll be negative. I'm a bottom-up mm -hmm. guy as well. I think you want to be selective. But it's very interesting to hear that the most overheated things are safety trades and fang. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I don't think I don't think it could be both. Ultimately there's just pockets of bottom up opportunities in all the above sectors.